G'day my friends and welcome to Marty's Garden on YouTube. Yep, a Sunday live show coming straight from my home studio here on the mid-north coast of New South Wales and today we're talking about progressive worm farming. Now it's not going to be exactly what you think. This show is going to be really for the enthusiasts, the worm nerds, the historians, people that are interested in the future of what our world can hold on to. And you, I think if you're into this type of stuff, you'll be absolutely blown away. And maybe you know some of it also. So I'd like you to really be interactive into this show. And then we'll get sort of towards a Q&A uh, at the end. And people that want to throw stuff in, like, I've never produced a show like this before. And it's taken me a bit of time to write the notes and get it down and put it into this structure. Because what we're looking at is... First, we'll look at the history of fertilization and composting to move into the progression of what worm farming could possibly mean for uh, the future of this planet, right? And you'll be, this, if you haven't heard this stuff before, it could absolutely blow you away. Um, it just sort of come to me when I was working on a private job. I've been doing a private job for the last couple of months. That's why I haven't been online uh, so much, trying to get some some, some bucks together and things and uh yeah it's just so here we are with something really exciting i believe now we're not going to be looking into sort of the tips and tricks of worm farming and stuff like that we're going to be taking this much deeper today and if that th type of thing interests you if you're sort of into this type of stuff hang around and really listen because i don't believe this has ever been spoken about before and look, what we're going to do is we've got a few crew in, so I'm just going to roll these across like we normally do. Michael Dvorak, are we ready to rumble? Yes, we are, my friend. I'm sure we are. As I said, it's going to be an interesting show. It's going to be a bit different to what I normally do. It's not so much a tips and tricks show. It's We're having a discussion about the future from going looking into the past, into history, and moving into the future of sustainable agriculture and and then looking at how we can possibly manage this type of stuff at our home too because small numbers of lots of people make a big difference you always notice that i mentioned that g'day s poppet nice to see you here morning james coach g man g'day mate the big wave and jess bridges thanks for sending that through guys i've got my water i'm filled up i may have to go get some more in intermediate because or intermission because Ah, it's warm here today, then we'll see how things go. Mm. So, the progression of worm farming is really interesting, right? Now, you can't find, there's not a lot of history on it when you look back. It's just basically, wherever there's people being composting or throwing out some type of waste, these compost worms have been around. And so, it's interesting that man didn't discover it as quickly as what we would have thought. And that actually the way that the history of fertilization and nitrogen was right under our fingertips pretty much the whole time and not being used accordingly. So, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's pretty amazing stuff. Now, I know I'm getting a bit excited here, but I just want to share this with you today to really push this forward because I've had some people write to me and say, so, Marty, one of the reasons we really get into what you're doing is you're a voice for the progressiveness of this. And uh, so, you know, I really sort of take note of that and believe that um, I can make a difference through our community and out to the world and via YouTube and different things. And uh, look, we started off with a super sticker straight away from Jeff, Jess Bridges. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. That is just, uh, just awesome. I really appreciate any super sticker, super chats, any amount really helps uh, this channel keep on going forward. So, uh, yeah, super appreciative. And what we do normally when we get a super chat or a super sticker, we've got the fake crowd. So is the fake crowd going to work? Hang on, we've got the, I think it's muted. We'll just put it on. Let's go now. Let's try again. Come on, crowd. Here we go. Turn it up. Turn it up. Now it's giving us music. <laughs> Here it is. Yay! Yeah, I just, I'm a little bit out of sort of sync. Haven't done a show for a little while, live show, so forgive me for that. But thank you so much, Jess Bridges, for 
uh, that. I salute you. Cheers a whole lot. And uh, yeah, absolutely awesome. So what? how did this live show come about? Well, I was at a private job uh, locally building a big garden, doing worm farms, setting up worm farms at the end of these big garden beds. So everything can be self-sufficient, feeding on site and have a central loop so nothing leaves uh, the garden and grows a lot, a lot of food. And we got into a discussion about a few things, and I was talking about sort of, you know, the, the history of um, how people have been thinking differently and because of the, mar- the way marketing's been targeted as for a very long time about how we actually apply fertilizers and how we actually use and farm in the garden, right? So if we go right back, way back before the introduction of synthesized uh, fertilizers, which we're going to talk a little bit more about and some other things, some other interesting stuff of how that actually came about. you got to look back and go, okay, people were, the art of composting was around. It existed, right? And we un- we understood that worms, whenever we created more fertility, we had worms around and things like that. There would have been people jotting this down, you know, and passing it on to family and children and all that type of stuff. But it didn't go into, uh, you know, a lot of books and all that type of stuff in those days. Um, And so it was passed on through through word of mouth and stories and things uh, to families and, and stuff. And so we had to compost a lot to grow our own food at home and to grow our own plants. And if you look back, like you go right back, into uh, probably the 1800s or something like that in parts of Europe and stuff, they had big glass frame houses, right? And they were doing all types of b- botanical experiments and all types of things. And they were they had to compost, yeah, to grow all these amazing plants. And they, they were bringing plants more around the world to sort of work out different types of agricultural techniques and all that type of stuff. So people had to do this. Um, they didn't really have uh, a choice. There was no other way. Um, that's what we did. We recycled what we had. And then we usually would have some in those times, you know, right up until sort of 1900s and into uh, mid 1900s and further on. Well, you know, uh, I'm probably getting a bit off track here, but chickens played a vital role of uh, cleaning up waste as well. So we fed out through our chicken, our scraps, food scraps out the chickens, just out the window or whatever, or out on the lawn and bang, 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 they would eat those. Um, the, the chickens didn't have all that feed and grain around so much in all those days. Um, they pr- probably got a little bit. If there was a bit left over, if someone was farming wheat or something like that and there was chaff left over, they would let them in there and do their thing and whatever. And if there was piles of maybe some chaff left over, then maybe the worms would be getting in there and then they would grab that and compost that. and be, You know, everything was like in this already this controlled cycled loop. So it wasn't like, oh, let's talk about that. You go, man, that's just what we do. What do you mean? There is no other option, right? But if we look at, if you start looking at history, right, and as man started to, we started to populate, this is where it gets really, really interesting. And we're still looking at this now, and it's, it's, it's a scary thing. We're looking at the population growth, right? It's growing, it's growing extreme, extremely fast. And we know that by the year 20, 50, 50, there's going to be a certain amount of people on the earth. If anyone knows that that number, just whack that down um, there as we speak. And I'd be glad to pull that uh, forward. We'll just say g'day to Barry here. Hey, Barry, how you going, mate? Cheers all from hot and humid Queensland. Yes, yeah, hot and humid here too, brother. Maybe a bit more so up your way. Anyway, so what we're looking at is the um, as sort of like the world's growing, right? And so we're looking at Europe. Uh, the Americas and the US, um, we needed to feed the people. We need to feed the people. And there was problems. We couldn't, they couldn't grow uh, the cities and things like that. Now, if you look back in history, ancient Rome had figured out to plant legumes to produce nitrogen for their soil, right? So they had done that. But why hadn't this introduction been passed on? It had been almost forgotten again and wasn't being used again in parts of Europe and the Americas, right? So some people were using but not in uh, large-scale production to grow food. So we had these homesteads popping up around the place, farms and things, feeding these little towns and stuff. Towns are exploding, cities are growing, all that, and they're going, well, how do we grow more food? We need more nitrogen. And so this is where it gets really, really interesting, guys, and this is where it really, it brings it from a historic point of view 
Now, you would never maybe have thought of this. Some of you who know history about food production and all that type of stuff will, but bat guano. Have you ever heard of bat guano? If you've heard of bat guano, let me know in the comments box on the side there. Uh, and also, uh, let me know if you've used it in any way. It is super high in nitrogen, right? It's like, it's like the bomb stuff. And... I've got some notes here that I've written down. So it was around about 1804, it was a Prussian geographer, and his name was Alexander von Humboldt. I've just got that written down there, because that's a hard one to remember. So what he made a discovery was, was when, you know, there was all this European conflict on, they're all going out on discoveries, searching for all new treasures and shiny things and all that. This guy was really clever. He thought, hang on, the world needs nitrogen. And, uh, you know, we can just fly under the radar here and harvest this bat guano from these islands around South Americas and start selling it to um, all these people that need nitrogen to actually grow more produce and farm better lands. Because people don't know this, but going way back, we're talking hundreds of years back, we were already degrading our land. Uh, yeah, we were hammering it and we were using... You know, certain techniques that have only just starting to disappear now of deep tilling and destroying the soils and things, right? So you had to, what was being taken away from the farm had to be replaced because the, the, the way that we manage farms for many, many years has been really bad, right? Really bad. And um, so you always had to keep filling up what you lost and that was by supplying more nitrogen. And bat guano solved that problem for quite a long time. And so here we go, uh, Keen Garden Stars. Yes, I've heard about guano on TV. Never been near bats personally, <laughs> no. But, uh, you know, like all bird droppings, you know, off the rocks and things like that and around side the caves and stuff like that. It's all sort of pretty similar. But where the bats were, they'd been dropping for hundreds of years and just building up layers and layers. I would have hate to have been a bat guano um, miner. You know how, like, um, you get chicken poo on your hands or whatever. I was just had my hands in some fresh horse manure the other day, and it was all. Oh, I'm still got a bit of a bad, you know. Man, you got to wear gloves, right? So I can imagine what it did to these guys' lungs and all that type of stuff. It's just terrible. But anyway, yeah. So bat guano was like absolutely massive, right? And um, they fought wars over this stuff. So I've got the so the dates here was 1864 to 1866, Spain and Peru. We'd be, we're bluing for it, big time, for a couple of years. They wanted it. And then later on, the, the Americans have gone, well, we're going to bring out a new mandate, a new law. And so then any American finds a, uh, a bat guano island, you can seize it and take it. <laughs> right? This is how much it was needed. Uh, it's, just, it's just insane. And so they were, they were going 10,000 nautical kilometres to take it from South America all the way over to uh, to to Europe, right? And along the way, there was wars. Like we're talking flat out. So I'm going to pull this up now because I reckon this is pretty fun. Uh, look at that. You know, like, man, these guys were battling it out over nitrogen, right? Now think about it. World resources, we need resources, right, for the world to go on. And then there's also like, because we were, they were moving in between trade routes and things, there was trade. And so these guys had lots of money. They owned these ships, these big trade companies. They would be going through and going, hey man, that's an America's going down and going, we're gonna seize those islands. It's all on, like we're talking a battle wars over nitrogen because they need it to expand the population and to for growth uh, of the human race, right? And so we're still looking at that now. And so what's happened is, is it's just gone. It's just gone absolutely mental. Now, um, have you heard this stuff before? Uh, it's pretty interesting stuff, and it really does show us a, a concept of the direction that we can possibly make a, a, a big change, and how much um, this nitrogen, nitrogen and fertilizers and things still needed, but without having so much different, you know, hurting the earth so much, damaging what we've already created and starting to heal the land. I'm all about healing the land and, uh, you know, composting, vermicomposting is uh, a way to do that. 
And I'm surprised they've got all this money to put into these boats, into all these things and all that. And they haven't even looked at this humble little worm that uh, could possibly make, you know, kilos upon kilos, upon hundreds of kilos every day if they wanted to. They had the technology that they could make boats, you know. So they got the technology to make these big farms. But it was flying under the radar the whole time. So, yeah, interesting stuff, right? If you're finding it interesting, give us a big thumbs up. I know this isn't for everyone, but we will be moving forward to why we're moving to the progression of uh, the worm farming stuff. Uh, there we go. Billy May, I think that the seabird guano are the best organic forms. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's very good stuff for sure. And imagine feeding it, you know, letting it compost a bit and feeding it to your compost worms. You know, 10 times more nutrient dense, right? Why couldn't they be thinking about that and going, hang on, we can just, and then we apply less and, you know, there's, these, they had the science around in these days. Um, don't believe that we were all stupid, that, that they were stupid. They definitely weren't. Um, we just didn't have the technology to, um, to do a lot of the testing and things. But they, you know, we're going to be getting into that uh, in a little bit. Billy May, it's actually no good that we are taking. It's disturbing the caves and the ecosystems going on in there. But there's no other good form of phosphorus. Bat guano is the best than sea bird guano. Yeah, it's a good point. Good point. Um, I, I believe there, you know, we can make our own phosphorus in the ground um, through uh, good organic uh, farming systems. It does actually appear. But um, yeah, yeah, when we're looking at sort of the money, turning it over, applying it quickly, getting it on, stuff like that, you know, like the guano, yep, <laughs> it was taking over the world uh, at that time. So it wasn't until, um, I've got it written down here, until 19, so think of this, so, so for 1800s, for we're talking 100 years, bat guano was the thing, and it flew under the radar for about 60 years. So I think what we got here, I've got the war date here, 1864 to 1866, uh, the Spain and Peru had a big blue over it for two years, full on hard at war. Um, so it was it was going on, and then we had you know another 40 years of so, okay maybe trade routes, dealings all going on, all still coming out of uh, the Americas to um, South America to go across to Europe up to America. We were talking early 1900s, I think 50 million people. Uh, in America then, and get, check, check me if I'm wrong, but they needed, still needed more guano to actually feed the soils and feed the, the systems and all that And because we were ruining our soils as we were going and we needed to replace it and we couldn't replace it with just the farming systems that we were using. So the Americans were, deep, Americans were deeply involved until like this is where things really flip on its head, right? Now I've got the date here. Heber Bosch. Now, do you know that that name? B O S C H Bosch. Everyone's seen that everywhere, right? This guy in the early of 20s, 20th century, invented 1909, invented the uh, synthetic um, agricultural nitrogen, right? So he saved it. He, he changed, started changing everything, and you know, then it was another. So we're moving into the First World War, Second World War. And then there was over surplus of oil and things like that. And that's what they used to create this synthesized nitrogens. And they worked out how to synthesize other sort of like salts and things into it to create more of a, uh, you know, a longer generation. So when you think about it, right, and you look back at the history, they go, guano was a major scientific discovery. It was making plants grow like crazy. And they're going, yes, this is unreal. And then 1909. Synthetic fertilizer come out. It was making plants grow like crazy. Yes, <laughs> you know, like this is just it's just mental stuff, right? And so, and then we had like the wars, you know, First World War, Second World War, extra surplus of the oil left over, and so they go, what do we do with it all now? Okay, well we've got crap loads of it. We can make synthetic fertilizer out and just sell it to the world. Right, we'll make a fortune, we'll change all the marketing, we'll tell people that they actually have to actually apply this stuff on, this is the way to do it, this is how you'll get the best growth, this is how you get the best best plants, um, this is the cheapest way to do it, super cheap to do it. You can buy it $2.50, the real cheap stuff, a little round container, right, like from Bunnings, I think the $2.50 is the cheapest one. Um, so yeah, super cheap stuff to make. 
And uh, the problem is with um, the worm farming side of things is they may start looking into it and going, hang on, it's, it's too expensive and we can't have, we haven't got the massive volumes to pass it out to get it out to the big markets. So let's just flog everyone this stuff and uh, who cares if it destroys the waterways and, you know, affects plant life and all that type of stuff. We're just going to make a crap load of money. You know, they're like a big massive drug dealer in a way, you know, like let's just do it anyway. We'll ruin the world and uh, we'll make, we'll make, I was going to swear, we'll make a, a lot of money. Very interesting stuff, but the mindset of people are changing now. And you've noticed that maybe in the last few last month or so in my videos, talking about how I was wrong, I think I've made some mistakes, I was looking at this incorrectly, uh, and that I believe that it does have a future, but it will take some time uh, for this to change. And so, yeah, interesting history about back guano. I had no idea there were fights over this stuff. Yeah, amazing, amazing, <laughs> totally freaky. And if you think about it now, um, if we needed more land, we needed more resources, like the, Japan in, invaded, uh, attacked America, uh, Pearl Harbor, and then moved out of there because they needed resources. They were buying all their resources. They didn't have enough resources. So it's always about resources, right? But we can actually, so if you look at war and all those type of things, it's generally based around that. But we look at the resource of what uh, recycling can do and how much of it we actually have around the globe and how we can actually turn it into into nitrogen, right? Into a, into a nitrogen that's actually slow release. It can be released out to plants with no no effect to the uh, to the environment whatsoever. It can be taken up really, really easily by the plant. It improves the soil structure, improves the soil, improves the health of the land, and, and it improves the health of, of us as a living being. So it's amazing that it's just been sort of flying under the radar. And now I think with the change of, um, you know, the, the uh, hemp laws, the marijuana laws, things like that, it's becoming legal. People have got to have an options whether they want to buy a synthetic product or they want to buy a more natural product. I think when it comes down to the medicines and things like that, people are probably looking more at the organic product side of things. Um, as we move through and look at this into the future of what this, so if we just look at it, and we know it's not just nitrogen, right? But if we just look at it and just call it nitrogen, like back guano had other stuff in it too. But if we just look at it as that for the moment, we can see how valuable it is. They fought wars over this stuff, right? So if we can actually like get this out and start turning it over and start, you know, making this product for people, um, and that people are just showing, you know, like there's, you know, how do you put it, workshops at home, workshops at schools, workshops through uh, community centres, through councils, uh, things like that, you know, um, councils taking on uh, bigger recycling waste programs instead of like the one that they've got here where I live, they basically just, um, oh, I was going to say nuke it, but they, they, um, the same as they, they pasteurize it like milk, so they kill everything in it. So you're basically just getting this body of of broken down waste that has to absolutely then start breaking down again and start getting the, everything attached back onto it, become live again. It's basically dead, right? So you're buying a dead product. And, you know, by worm farming at home, we can make a huge difference if everyone's doing it and understanding it and recycling and using in their gardens and not going to these places and buying these chemical fertilizers and things and applying it onto the lawns and stuff. No, it's, it's always still going to have its place, but we can sort of cut it down if we under, start understanding how valuable nitrogen is and what people actually were doing with it. So I've got my list here. I just want to make sure that I've gone through and what we'll do. Okay, so we're at the create, innovate and find new ways, right? So... By creating and innovating and finding new ways, we can actually collectively make a change. If you saw my last video that came out yesterday, it was to do with my worm farming mix secret formula, something like that. Check it out if you haven't already. And it involves you know three or four different things. And one of them, if you've got access to it, uh, is the coffee grounds, right? Now, we still have a huge problem to solve in the world regarding coffee grounds. We're talking hundreds of tons, 
oh man, I don't know, the numbers just unfathomable of how many tons, maybe millions of tons a year going out of coffee grounds into um, these tips and things like that and just getting thrown out um, as waste. And it's a very strong nitrogen source. It has around about 11 different types of minerals in it, with nitrogen being one of the highest. So it's a really good base for actually setting stuff off to then um, start, the, progr start the, the progression of these things breaking down. Now, if we go back to the guano days, they would have had to have been when they're composting, they would have been buying the guano that's coming over from the, from, uh, the US, uh, from, from South America, and then using it in some areas to compost and break down, getting the nitrogen out of that and breaking down these systems and moving things faster and all that type of stuff. So they had the technology and then it sort of disappeared when we got to around to that 1909 thing. They go, well, we don't need that anymore. And then if you've looked at the product that's coming out in your shop of the bags of compost, if you're an older gardener like myself, you'd see just how bad it's gotten uh, over the years. It has gotten absolutely just shocking uh, and getting worse and worse uh, all the time because they're cutting prices and cutting costs and all that type of stuff. So we're looking at the create, innovate and find new ways. So we can find new ways for uh, coffee grounds to be collected and distributed and used out uh, into places like community gardens, community farms, you know, uh, worm farming places, stuff like that. Uh, in New in uh, Melbourne, they've got two trucks. They drive around, they collect it all. I think it's subsidised by the government somehow, and then they drop it off at community gardens. And so, you know, they could be dropping people could be drop picking these up at each one. The councils are paying for them. They've got the trucks. They run around. They grab all these coffee grounds instead of going off to the tip. Then it gets dropped off to the local worm farm or the local community garden. And we're talking like, look, I pick up around about a cube. A month, so um, one three, I think it's three cubic feet uh, a month. But I'll probably be doing around about two cubic feet a month soon. And that's just me going to a handful of cafes. Um, yeah, it's just just amazing, right? So we need to sort of look at ways that we can sort of innovate and change things and work at ways and ways that we can actually start composting uh, this waste that we have. Like I speak to some of the cafes and I go, I can't believe how much waste gets thrown out uh, every day. It's just just amazing. And this stuff's just, it's, as it's getting thrown out, it's just going off into landfill and it's, it's so valuable. And people don't realise that it turns into nitrogen and you can actually, like people would have made wars over this stuff years ago. If you know how to do it properly, they go, let's go and invade Marty's garden. Uh, we're going to take it all and collect it for ourselves in the name of the US. <laughs> we'll grab all this technology, you know, like, and we'll just use it. <laughs> That's how they were. Uh, so pretty funny. So just let me have a little drink there. So I wanted to bring that forward and talk about the past history of the, the way that it sort of moved forward. I know it's not for everyone. We don't have a a massive audience here today, 16 people watching, 16 thumbs up, but interesting stuff. And, um, you know, I think that sometimes we need to go back in time to move forward into the future to look what we've got. So how do we progress on forward into becoming uh, a nation that will understand? Well, basically, it all comes down to money. If you look at the wars, while they're fighting about it and what, you know, like and that type of thing. If they can, people can start using the technology and making these bigger systems. So another thing that got me thinking about is like, so I've moved across to um, the Three Brothers landscaping site now at Dunbogan where I am, and I've got about six times the space what I had uh, before. So I'm really ramping things up. And I'm the only person that I know locally in this area. There is another one in the Northern mm. Rivers at Ballina called Go Grow. Um, but they still don't do worm farming. They make organic soils and compost and things. They're probably one of the biggest ones I've ever seen. Uh, be on a maybe four four acres or something like big, massive wind tunnels and things. And it just totally blows my mind, the soil science around it. Because they're right near the Northern Rivers where they have all the macadamia farms, avocado farms and all that. So they've got the, they can sell this product, right? And um, yeah, so... It's got me really thinking about how I'm scaling things up, how I'm going to be producing 
having to get more, a bit more machinery, produce things much faster, turn things over much quicker, and looking at and just looking at and going how valuable it actually is to be able to grow in something that is a live living product. Like one of the guys called me up and said, Marty, he goes, is your stuff alive? He said, where I got my other garden soil? He goes, it's just dead and it's not growing anything. I need to get something that's nice and alive that I can grow nice healthy food. And it's interesting that no one else has this stuff. Well, not in my town anyway or nearby within the next 400 kilometers. And I said, they're not farm worming. And so the worm farmers now, they're making castings, which is okay. But still, again, around near my area, they're not making compost. They're selling a casting. And so people have then got to go out and buy a compost or buy some type of something else and then feed the worm casting as an amendment, right? So when we're worm farming, we need to be thinking about as we're making our compost, okay, it's time to get the worms out. It doesn't need to be all finished. Not always. It can be two-thirds finished, one-quarter finished. You're grabbing that out. You, let it, you, you, know, you bait the worms up so they come out. And then you... Get as many out as you can. Maybe mix a little bit of cocoa peat or something in it and bang, you've got like a potting mix, right? So um, I think the, I think what we're doing is we're thinking about still a little bit incorrectly. Now, I know some people are going to get upset with me for saying this, but I don't want you to always think as a worm casting as an amendment because then we're looking at it like this the synthetic side of things of how we add stuff to grow things, right? So... Now, I still want you to think as an amendment as well for certain things. Like you might be, you might have some sand or something or some cocoa peat, and you want to add that to that to make a seed raising mix. But overall, we're making we're making a compost that we can grow in overall. And so if we can change that mindset to go back to the old days when my grandparents, my granddad was far, he was a great gardener. Uh, my grandfather was actually a part of the uh, lost genera- stolen generation of the Aboriginals, like we believe. Um, but he was a, a wonderful gardener. I only just have slight memories of it when I was very young. And he lived a sustainable lifestyle because they were very poor, actually. So they had chickens, grew their own food, all that stuff, eight kids or something. And um, mum told me when she was younger, they had to put cardboard in their shoes and stuff, you know. So they understood the value of having chickens and growing the food and making this compost and all this type of stuff. And it was done in different ways. Um, and then, you know, there were certain people that couldn't even wouldn't even buy this synthetic stuff because they didn't really know about it, it hadn't been introduced to them. And it wasn't really until maybe the last 30 or 40 years that it really started getting promoted heavily, right? 18 bees. A neighbor, a neighbor stopped by to look at my log beehive. And she pointed to a bunch of my large black totes and asked, what the heck are those for? <laughs> Told her it's my worms for making worm tea, little worm factory. Yeah, see, so, you know, so just the small things like that can make such a big difference. And I bet your 18 bees, you're getting a lot of when you're sort of breaking it down as well, or do a 10 to 1 or just make it like a, a wheat tea, it really goes a long way, right? So it's unreal that people just notice that type of thing and just you get me and instantly that lady could go, that's such a good idea, I'm gonna do that too. And so uh, yeah, it just changes things. Smoke screen TV, cheers Marty and all. So we've been talking about the history of, of uh, nitrogen, uh, bat guano and synthetics and then moving into uh, a new revolution of compost worm, compost farms, right? And worm farming. And the, the, next, the next revolution is basically going to be, you know, obviously it's the, the, the marijuana stuff, you know, the legal stuff in the States and places. Australia It's going to be 10 years behind on this, but uh, it will happen. Then maybe one day I'll get hired by a big company to, um, <laughs> to make their worm castings. Who uh, you knows? Uh, so there we go. The green of life. Worm castings like a biology bomb for your soil or potting mix. It totally is. It really is. And this is where we forget. And so that's why I'm saying you look at it as an amendment, but also look at it as a body of something that you can use. And it doesn't have to, when you're worm farming, it doesn't have to always be finished. Um, you can get it two thirds of the way through, one quarter of the way through, just depending on the material that you're using. If you're just using a, um, a leaf stick bedding, like what we're looking at here on the screen here, that makes an amazing uh, potting mix, right? So if you're making a potting mix, these are the materials you want to use. You might use a little bit of cardboard, a little bit of newspaper, but you'd be mostly using light sticks, leaves, twigs, and feeding it a bit of nitrogen. 
So it might be a bit of cow manure. Uh, definitely wouldn't be bat guano. It's too expensive. <laughs> but, you know, a bit of, you know, horse manure sometimes has a bit too much seed in it and things. But, you know, you might be using a bit of aged chicken manure, uh, maybe even coffee grounds like I do. And, um, or a bit of a mix of a little bit of everything. And once that sort of break down in humusy, man, you can grow straight in that. And just, you just get a little bit of maybe some, if it has enough enough body, you just get a little bit of, you know, good cocoa peat, mix that through it. And uh, boom, you've got like just this amazing product that will grow plants like crazy. I'm working on a, I've done off and on a potting mix from my place on the micro farm here. And I'm going to work on developing a, um, a potting mix more on my site at Free Brothers where I am. And that will be mostly the, uh, the leaf mold sticks and, and coffee grounds and a little bit of um, some other things, maybe a little tiny little bit of mushroom, a little bit of cow to sort of like get the nitrogen process and breaking it down really humusy. So the stick's almost bendy, you know, so you're looking at it and going, oh, wow, what is that? You go, oh, yeah, it's a stick, right? So it's sort of like that. And we're putting it into our potting mixes and things and growing amazing plants with it. And I tell you, Plants just grow like nothing uh, you've ever seen before. And it should grow like that, just like it did probably in the old days for my grandfather who was doing this type of thing. 18 bees. Yeah, I really dilute it. She said exactly that. Marty, yeah, that's way, that's way cool. Mind reader. Doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> so what we're going to do is I want to get into sort of like a, uh, a Q&A here. You can ask me anything that you like. But also talking about uh, the progression of it and what you've seen, how you think and feel about it, sort of the future of it going forward, you know, the progressiveness of it. And I'll sort of mention about the progressiveness of it also, which I'm just about to cover next. If we're going from being just, you know, having a couple of small worm farms, then we want to actually just look at maybe scaling up a little bit, moving up to a bathtub worm farm or something like that. So, yeah, start throwing out the questions. Let's start talking about, let's start having a chat, let's start sharing. And this is the, the, the part that I enjoy the most. Uh, I know, like I said before, that video really wasn't, it's not for everyone, but it does show uh, how valuable it is. And without me going back into the history of this type of, these type of products, um, we can't really sort of think forward of how valuable it is. Not, not many people would have known that um, hundreds of thousands of lives, lives were lost over uh, a fertilizer, right? So, yeah, really scary stuff. And that, and that the Americas, I didn't know that, that America said, right, anyone, any U.S. citizen can go down there and you can take, you can seize a bat guano island in the name of the U.S. and we will back you for it. That is pretty mental, right? So they just go and kill everyone, any natives there or whatever. You know, just or just pull out gun. So we're going to take. You don't need your back guano. <laughs> Apparently, the Incas were using it uh, right through in that time. So it's it's been known about for quite some time. And I really like the part that flew, those guys flew under the radar for sixty years while the other dudes were chasing gold and silver and all this other shiny stuff. And they were lining their pockets uh, by selling uh, a fertilizer and making a lot of money. And so I sort of see uh, vermicomposting composting being like that a little while, flying under the radar for a little while, and then slowly growing out until eventually people are going to be, we should all be doing that. We need to be doing that more regularly. And um, yeah, so we got vermicompost learned by doing. Hello, Marty and everyone. Sorry, I'm late. I'll rewatch for beginning after love from you all. Yeah, if you're interested in some history, uh, then why not check it out uh, for sure. And so interested in what you guys have got to say. If you've got any questions uh, regarding, maybe let me know what you're doing, what's working for you, uh, how you intend on maybe moving forward. Do you have a way that you might scale up? Are you going to maybe bring out some, um, you're doing you've got small worm farms, you're going to do a bathtub worm farm, or you're going to do another type of stack system or whatever. So we're talking about sort of being progressive and moving forward and how we can change things. Maybe you're going to change your bedding a little bit. You've set up a water tank where you can put water, you can run rainwater down into your systems and just have a little dripper so it consistently stays moist and cool. These type of things really make a big difference. And when people hear them, you might think it's not much for you, but people that are watching the show, they go, oh, wow, I never would have thought of that. I wouldn't have even thought of asking about that. And these are the type of things that people tell me and are really stoked to uh, to hear and listen from. 
So yeah, we've got 17 people watching, 21 thumbs up. We've had a super sticker already. Thank you so much uh, for the super sticker. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to leave a super chat or a super sticker behind, I shouldn't say behind, um, yeah, it's greatly appreciated and it really does help the channel and these live shows to uh, keep on moving forward. All right, so progressiveness, what am I doing? Well, I've scaled up into the new farm, the micro farm's moved on to a new site. We've got two big vats that are sort of one vat now, windrows sort of running through, and then I've got my big biggest worm farms ever set up around sort of the outsides. I'm gonna be sifting and filling them up and breeding uh, the numbers up. Hopefully I'll get to uh, my one million uh, compost worms in the near future, so that'll be really interesting. But I'm not getting much, many people write anything or say, you're all a bit shy today, are you, on what's going on? I know that a lot of parts of the world, it's cold, there's not a lot going on, and it's really down south here in Australia where it's warm and hot that people are sort of moving forward. And in the other parts of the world, it's, it's a bit cold for worm farming uh, currently as we speak. But I think that if we, you know, if we start understanding hot composting a little bit more, and you understand the hot composting process, you can then actually start worm farming more through the winter time. And you know, these these big farms that are gonna be producing, you know, we're talking tons, I'm not talking like square meters like I do, but we're talking tons. They will have these big hot houses, right? These big hoops, and at the end, one big massive uh, pile of a heated compost. And then they can actually run water. So you run a big coil of water, in through the whole pile and then you run pipes up through underneath your worm farms and it just circulates back around through and keeps everything nice and warm. And uh, if and the you know the earth will stay warmer uh, than the actual land outside. So very possible to do. Uh, we just need to think more progressively on how we can do it. And you could do something like that in your own backyard if you've got a greenhouse, start setting up some hot comping, composting systems uh, in the end. James Coates, hey Marty, love today's info. Just a question, have you used biochar in your worm farms? Been watching number and number of videos have been using it. I use one hungry bin, four worm cafes and some. Yes, I have used it. Um, someone gave me a big bag once, about maybe about 40 litres. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, I've made some with Permi Pete once and I really liked it. Um, if I had the opportunity to make some again, uh, I would. I like the idea of it holding the biology, holding the surface area. Um, but I generally just use sort of wood chip uh, to do that, wood chip and leaf. It does a very similar thing. It's a very cheap way to do it. It's fast. And once you get a bit of nitrogen on the side, it starts breaking down. You've got all those little nodules. You think about inside a leaf, you've got all the little veins that running across, right? Well, as they start sinking down, those little veins are sinking down in between and the material is starting to decompose and become humusy. It's doing a very similar thing. It's setting up, it's setting up um, the place for the microbes to go. Now you've got to look at, um, so anything that you burn becomes a calcium. So, you know, like you can actually add too much and be, become, you can change the pH too much. But when we in Australia, we have a lot of forest burn offs and the forest has come back absolutely brilliant after that because of all the char that's fallen down from the forest floor. So I'm really into it. And if I had a way to actually make it uh, quickly and efficiently and add to my compost that I'm selling, I would definitely 100% do it and I would be adding it to my worm farms. Um, yeah, no doubt about it. All right, great question. And a good number of worm farm cafes there, one hungry bin as well, that's awesome. James Coates, homemade worm farms and paint buckets. Yeah, they're really cool. Uh, I really like those. Uh, as long as you put a lot of sort of like uh, holes in the top and on top and sort of like in the lid at top so you got that circulating air uh, because you can scale them up. That's the idea of the progressiveness. You've got one, you've got two, you go, oh, well, I've got, I can easily do two more. And then you go, hey, well, well maybe I should have six. You know, um, until you get to the point where you're going, oh, I've got enough now. Or maybe you get in one morning, give one away to someone or something like that, you know, teach them how to use it and hand it on. Vermicompost learned by doing. I was thinking of using an old garbage pail about three feet, one meter tall. Worms will get all the way down right away or should I build it up? 
I heard worms only work the first several inches. This is a really great question. I'm going to break this down right now. And again, some people won't like me to say it. They'll probably unsubscribe. <laughs> Just give me, or give me a thumbs down on it. Um, right, from my discoveries, I thought that too. And I was in the very first years, I was very shallow. Everything was very shallow because it's so heavy in the small worm farms. And I still recommend that in the summertime, not, you know, not in the summertime, but just not get too heavy if you're going to break your back picking these things up because worm casting and compost gets so heavy. But what I've found since I've been doing the windrows for the last, well, so we've been doing about five years, maybe a bit more, six years of, you know, blood volume composting just for when we're on the micro farm. And then here, last three years, producing a product to sell. I'm finding them down three feet deep. And what's happening is, is I don't water as much as I used to uh, because water can be, it's quite a good resource. And sometimes I want to harvest my product and I don't want it to be too wet while I'm harvesting. So in my wind rows, they can be anything two and a half, you know, um, two and a half feet high. The barrels can be two and a half feet, three feet high. I found them three feet down at the base of that. And what happens is the dry part, they'll go down and chase the moisture, right? So you can actually, if you turn it over more, you can actually make it much deeper, I believe, than what they say. And this has been one of the problems is that people read all this content online and go, oh, you can only do it shallow, you can only so much. So if you have a square, so many square meters, you can only produce so much. And then, oh, the numbers aren't there. Right, but the numbers are there because you can do it. You can see other farms they're making, um, you know, like this one in America. He does a cow manure bag, right? And they've got massive, big windrows. These farms, like they're huge. I think they're fifteen feet high. Now I know they don't have worms in them. But they're going over and turning them over machines, but you can do around about you know um, sort of two and a half to three feet high, as long as they're sort of round and or or pinnacled like that and the air's going into the sides because you're scooping off the top as you're collecting and then going down and then you're throwing back onto the top to feed and they go down when it's drier and hang right at the base and then when it rains, they're coming back up again. So they're chasing the moisture so they can keep their skin nice and moist and they mightn't be feeding as much. But um, yeah, so hopefully that helps with what you're considering doing. Just remembering you're harvesting from the top most of the time. Sometimes when it's been going for a long time, then you'll go and harvest down nice and deep. So that's what's working for me. And you give it a go, but I guarantee it'll be working for you. I've been doing that for a while, quite a while now. Uh, I like the direction your worm's going. Yeah, thank you, White Davey, uh, gardening your worm farm. I was nearly going to give up the composting uh, on the side of the house here because I just couldn't scale up anymore and I needed to expand and grow the business a bit more than what it was until we uh, bartered a great deal. So, you know, it's going to be new information coming out of there uh, over time. As I'm learning, I'll be sharing that uh, as well. And then I might do like privates. If anyone wants to do a private one-on-one -on -one with me, um, I might do something like that where I'll sort something out through the buy me a coffee, set a link up and there has to be a payment processor to pay me for my time uh, for that if you want to set up some type of business or something. I'm just starting to sell locally here in Las Vegas. Good on you, Dick Kine. I've been breeding worms inside my house in bus bins and outside more worms for composting in raised garden beds. Yeah, raised garden beds work pretty good. <laughs> I quite like them. I've been looking at that option as well. Uh, and like I said, you can go much deeper than you think as long as you can dig in there and Get it, and if you don't mind turning it over, you know, like it's not every three days, every couple of weeks or something like that, you can get away with it, turn it over, and bring the old stuff from the bottom back to the top. And the stuff that's getting eaten more at the top goes down to the bottom. Then you've got castings that are down the bottom, and new castings building at the top. And then you know you, you're harvesting it and going. You're not harvest. I don't harvest when it's all just worm castings. Most some sections I do, but um, which I'm where I'm creating amendments, but. The other section, I'm just making compost. I'm thinking, oh, this has been chewed through. It's, it's ready. It's probably got 20% worm castings in it. That's perfect for the customer. They don't want to be adding all this stuff. They just want to grab it and grow something, right? That's basically it, yeah? Uh, so, yeah, good on you, Dakone. That's that's really great, man. Um, keep, keep Just keep rolling on with it and just try and think progressive, you know, and, and understand, like what I said before, I got it wrong. I forgot the value of this. 
it is much more valuable than what we uh, believe. As I was saying before in the beginning of the show, they fought wars, hundreds of thousands of people, nations and nations, and sailing tens and thousands of nautical kilometres of miles and countries saying that we're going to take over another piece of land in the name of our country so we can have bat guano. Uh, it's just absolutely mental. And this stuff is, is possible. It's even better, right? Because bat guano, if used to too much, it will still burn. It needs to be processed, used properly, correctly, all that type of stuff where worm castings is just a superior product all over. So how do I sell worms and vermicompost locally on a small basis? That's a good question. Um, I think that it's that's really sort of like more of a whole show sort of all on itself. And something that I'm looking at possibly doing in the future of, you know, as consultancy stuff, but it's more of a paid thing. Um, but, you know, you just have a look at for now, have a look at other companies, the way they're doing it, look at their model and try and find a, a way of creating a similar model for you, but, but differentiate yourself a little bit. So you look a little bit different. You might just be a little bit more modern. You might have different uh, ideas and values and concepts to them a lot of the older stuff i believe they're moving out their values and concepts are way different than what they should be now so it's the sustainability and like i said the example of just going and using coffee grounds it's free you can collect so much at every day if you can reform an efficient system and produce something that's really like and create this really good relationship with these people that run these cafes and you'd be surprised where they can lead to um yeah you can make some really good friends too like i have so just start off very small and you know um i would start like to sell compost through um marketplace on facebook don't put anything fancy now with worms or anything like that right anything like that in there because they just facebook won't allow you to do it just write you know organic compost local um, and then put a good price, you know, and people will come and buy it. So, yeah, good luck. I, I wish you all the best of it. This is why we're here to try and help promote this and move this stuff forward, a progressive thing. But uh, like I said, in the, maybe the next few weeks, I'll set something up in my Buy Me A Coffee page and it'll be like a live one-on-one -on -one like this where we can chat and I can help you. Um, I might set up a mentor program or something like that if people are interested uh, in that. So make money with composting or something. Yeah, here we go here. P. Hubbard, my worms go down to two feet. See, there's another person saying exactly the same thing as me. They definitely do. And um, yeah, they chase the moisture, chasing temperature. If it's really hot, they'll go down as well. If it's really cold, they'll come up into the warmer spaces. So uh, yeah, definitely. White Davy Gardening and Worm Farm. Burn me costume, but if you fill the garbage bin, the worms will spread out in it. Yeah, good advice. Thank you, thank you very much. So what have you thought about the show so far? You know, I know it was very different. We did sort of take it a different angle. I wanted to come across in that way to show how valuable uh, it, this vermicompost actually is and the progressiveness of it is. I'm going to be moving forward and producing. So I've normally got at max three square meters at my place or three cubic. So one cubic feet is three feet. Three. I'm just trying to remember for the Americans or one meter squared. So I've got around about eight or nine of those uh, being turned over at the moment at my, at my new space. And then I'll be bagging and mixing and blending and making. Um, so I'm making a seed raising mix. I'll be making a, a potting mix. And I'll be making a, a compost bed mix for like people can use in their raised garden beds, under fruit trees, under roses, that type of thing. And have, uh, yeah, two or three different products sort of over time. And also, I'll, you know, people want to come and buy worms off me locally. I'll be doing that. I won't be shipping them out as of yet. Um, because at the moment, they're more valuable for me as a worker than for another form of cash flow. But if people come and see me, they ring me up, can you get me a 1,000 or 2,000, something like that? Um, or I'm going to set up a worm farm or give them some bedding and some worms together in a bag. And they can just go and pour it into the whole worm farm um, instead of going out and buying cocoa pea, buying compost worms separate, buying conditioner, all these different things. It just, it's just set up, uh, ready to go. And I find, yeah, I do a few of those here and there. They work, uh, they work pretty good. So we've got about five minutes left to go. If anyone's got any more questions, 
please fire away. Uh, always happy to help out where I can and do uh, have a little bit of a chat. Um, I might go down and even have a look at the surf after this because really today is supposed to be my day off. But because we haven't done anything live for such a long time, um, I just needed to get back out here. And I really wanted to talk about this subject uh, as well and sort of put it out there. I don't know how, how, how the community or whatever, how everyone's just going to take this piece of content. Um, sometimes I bring out something different. I get a ton of unsubscribes. But anyway, it just is what it is. I've got to keep doing what I believe in and um, and also share what I, where I think is the future and my knowledge and the progression. And, you know, without looking back into history, we can't move forward. So um, if anyone that's sort of, you know, got a bit of wisdom about them, I think they would understand uh, what I'm saying there. So I've got here, Jamin Hutch, I have snow on my compost pile, how to warm it up. Uh, it's probably a bit late, you've got to make a hot compost pile. Lots of material and nitrogen to uh, to sort of heat it up. Um, yeah, so, you know, like coffee grounds, the bottom, but it's already wet and moist. I don't know, it might be too late. Generally what we do is we start our hot compost piles before the snow sort of comes and get it hot for as long as we can until eventually, depending on how much snow it has, cools it down. Now, I don't live in a really cool place. I, don't even sub, I live in the subtropics. So, uh, sorry, I can't really give you the best answer probably for that. Um, I, some type of cover, though, underneath a, a greenhouse cover would probably be help as well. What is your best favourite compost worm to use? If I was just to choose one, it would be the, you know, the tiger worm, red wiggler, something like that. They're just good overall. But I like having all of them. They all serve a good purpose. Um, and as many as I can. I notice in summer I've got more tigers, in winter I've got more, you, um, in summer I've got more the night crawlers, Africans, and then I've got Euros more in the winter. They come and go, the balance is changing depending on the food all the time, but I've always got them. So uh, as long as they're there, I don't mind what type they are, as long as they're sort of just getting used to the environment and whichever one's preferring that space, that time, that climate is performing, then uh, yeah. That's sort of the answer. I know it's really not exactly the right answer, but just to choose one, it would be uh, the yellow tile, yellow tails, one of the little yellow tails on them. <laughs> um, yeah, tiger worm. All right. So we are just about to finish up, my friends. Two and a half minutes to go. And what we normally do towards the end of these shows, we've got 21 people watching, 24 thumbs up. Thank you so much for your thumbs up, guys. If you haven't given me a thumbs up already for you, please do so. I'll help this live show spread out a bit more as it goes out to the public um, to be, yeah, to be sit there on the internet for quite a while. And hopefully people will enjoy uh, the story and the process of what we spoke about and your questions and comments and things. So what we normally do is people say goodbye to each other in the show here, I drag it across into the, my little box here down below, and we have a chat. I'm going to put on the fighting, <laughs> the fighting boats there, uh, just having you look back and going back at the history of guano and how actually like valuable this stuff was. I actually started looking at it more like more more than gold in some perspectives because they needed it to thrive their countries and build their communities and you know population growth and all that stuff. So very, very interesting history. If you didn't see that, go back and watch the beginning of this show. Watch the rerun and uh, learn the history about how fertilizer evolved into something really valuable to where it is uh, today. Really quite uh, amazing. All right, so as I said, I will be dragging these comments across. We're going to be putting a little bit of tunes on uh, right now. Please say goodbye to your friends. Go and have a surf. Check the waves in, mate. The sun is warm. There's a gentle breeze. All the birds are making homes inside the evergreens. The air is clear. With our loved ones close, you can pick out every star without a telescope. So beautiful to see how we have changed In time, you know Everything we've lost comes home again And I will grab onto your arm A little stronger than we were before I've missed 
Tell you what, I'm getting a sweat up here. I'm looking forward. I'm going to head, jump down the beach, have a look at what the waves are like, have the rest of the day off. And look, guys, stay safe, everyone. Stay well. Keep enjoying life. And yeah, get out there and just just do it, man. Whatever you're doing and you're psyched to go, just do it and enjoy it. Have a great day. Happy worm farming. And we'll see you at the next video real soon. <laughs> see you, Laura. Just check out the rerun or we'll see you soon. Bye for now, guys. Bye.